Um, welcome everyone to the first colloquium speaker. Uh, this quarter will be Frederick Appel Olsen, which we're honored to have. Frederick is a doctoral student in the Department of Communication at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. He's also a visiting scholar in our department this year, working with Leah. His PhD project revolves around scientific activism and ethos in the climate crisis with a focus on social movements such as the Scientist Rebellion. He's also interested in political rhetoric, public debate, and polemics. Frederick's work and interests have taken him far and wide. His undergraduate was in rhetoric at the University of Copenhagen. While he was in college, he spent some time in Hong Kong as an exchange student at Ling, Lingnan University studying philosophy. After his bachelor's, Frederick worked as an editorial assistant for a website that brands itself as Denmark's leading science medium. He also oversaw the social media and internal communication channels in the Department of Chemical and Biochemical Engineering at the Technical University of Denmark. While working on his doctoral studies, he spent a summer at Columbia University as a visiting graduate student in the creative writing program. So welcome, Frederick. We are really honored to have you. Before I hand the floor to you, I would just like to quickly remind everyone on the Q&A rules. So we would like to save the questions to the end, which Frederick has said that we'll, he will give us a lot of time for discussion. If you want to uh, participate, please in reactions, raise your hand. Uh, so you can do raise hand like I'm doing over here. And I will call in the end, uh, according to the order that you raised your hand. But please participate. We're eager to have your participation in the discussion. But anyway, the main character, Frederick, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Juan, uh, for a very, very nice introduction. Um, and before I, before I start the presentation, I would just want to say um, thank you to University of Washington's communication department for, for having me for these past four months. Um, uh, it's been uh, it's been a great time for me, and I've really learned a lot from it. Um, and so I also want to thank you for giving me the chance to speak here now at this colloquium uh, a few days before I, I leave the country and go back to Denmark. So thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, yeah, as Jan said, um, my PhD project is actually centered on something a little bit different from what I'm going to uh, speak about now. Um, and and um, you, yeah, you probably noticed that, and that, that may seem a little bit weird, but um, I'll be glad to talk to you about that uh, at any time. If you have something you want to discuss about um, uh, scientist activism or or uh, the rhetoric of science part of, of the research that I do, I'll, I'll do so. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And on that slide, there is my email address. Uh, and you can write me if you want to, yeah, to talk about uh, any of that stuff, um, which I've been, had the, had the privilege to, uh, to work with here as well, um, specifically uh, with, with Leah. Um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I had this idea, and now we'll see whether it was a good one or not, um, that it would be kind of interesting for you to learn something about uh, American uh, political rhetoric, influencing political rhetoric in Denmark, um, which I assume that you may not be very familiar with. Uh, so um, my idea was kind of to uh, build on the transatlantic conversation that my stay here is already a part of, um, by exploring this connection in rhetoric as well as in theory. Um, yeah, so to round off my stay here, I thought it would be appropriate to use this colloquium um, to reflect on the US-Denmark connection in itself, um, which can be said to have brought me here in the first place. So uh, I'll jump right into it. Um, the title of my talk is Something is Rotten in the United States Denmark, the trans bad influence of American political rhetoric and its rhetorical remedies. Uh, and I apologize for this notion of a bad American influence, and, uh, but I'm afraid it's true. Um, however, there is a lighter side to it as well, uh, which, and, and that is what I will uh, try to argue also. Uh, and that's, the, of course, the uh, rhetorical remedy part of this talk. Um, 
And I'll structure my presentation in, in three main parts. Uh, first, I give some case examples of how American right-wing and Trump-inspired rhetoric is being employed by politicians and lay people recently in the Danish public debate. I argue that this debate is increasingly characterized by dubious rhetorical strategies of, Trump, um, of Trumpism in various and often uh, unstable ways. Second, and this is the lighter side of the coin, I try to argue that US-based rhetorical scholarship on these tendencies are the best way to understand and fight back on this development. And lastly, I uh, use some specific examples of how American scholarship uh, in rhetoric is indispensable to my own work and uh, my home institution section for rhetoric as such. Now, in the beginning of all this, you might say, well, of course, Trump, like any other US president, is a global political figure, and he's not just an American one. But isn't it a little bit of a stretch to say that Trump and Trumpism has a direct and discernible and very bad influence on Danish politics? In other words, isn't populism and chauvinism more universal phenomena of which Trump is just the most recent American variant? Um, and my answer to that is, uh, these phenomena are certainly universal and preceding Trump and Trumpism. However, the direct influence of the specific form these phenomena take in Trumpism is, sadly, not a stretch. And to show uh, you the direct influence, uh, I'll, I'll show you now some case example of this uh, influence uh, from the political, de political debate in Denmark. On November 21st, 2020, uh, hundreds of farmers drove their tractors from all parts of Denmark to the country's two largest cities, Copenhagen and Aarhus. The tractor protesters were unhappy, to say the least, about Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen's government's decision to give an executive order to put down all minks in the country's mink farms. The health authorities believed that there was a likelihood that a new variant of the coronavirus would spread from these farms. In line with the cautious approach, of the Social Democrat government throughout the COVID crisis, they decided to give the order to have all the minks killed. This is what you see here in the, in the left picture. Um, but as it would later turn out, this order was given before the proper law work had been put into place, costing Minister for Food, Agriculture and Fisheries, Moen Jensen, his job. The farmers believed that this was a breach of constitutionally secured rights. And they have since then been handsomely compensated by the state for the losses. When the demonstration reached its endpoint at Lange Linje in Copenhagen, one of the speakers who took the podium was opposition politician and former minister for immigration, Inger Stoiberg. Uh, she's from the former, uh, the farmer friendly and former government party, Venstre. And uh, Stoiberg is known as quite a hardliner on immigration. Uh, famously, she was celebrating the hardships of immigrants with cake. Uh, and then, and in her speech to these angry farmers, she said, government offices have become a swamp of power that is slowly but surely devouring Danish democracy. And this has to end now. We have to confront the sickness of power. We have to confront the arrogance of power. We have to drain the swamp filled with Mette Frederiksen's arrogance of power. So this obvious allusion to Trump's repeated calls to drain the swamp in Washington, DC, was not lost on journalist and political opponent, opponents. When pressed on the issue, Stoiberg instead claimed that she was re referencing Ronald Reagan, who used the same phrase. Although this is true, it doesn't make it any less of a Trumpist ap appeal as Trump consciously has borrowed this slogan, like make America great again from Reagan. And as she surely knows that the audience of a speech would be more likely to connect the phrase to Trump as most people also did. And note here that the banner behind Stoiberg is showing a caricature drawing of uh, Prime Minister Frederiksen. Uh, and on this, there's a, a, a text, which is a to-do list, uh, where mink farmers are the first point and it's crossed out. And then agriculture, transport, construction and media and other things are next on the list. Uh, and the button of the picture asks, or maybe it doesn't ask, but, but there's no uh, question mark. Is there a hidden agenda? This is conspiracy material of the sort that modern Trumpists are excelling at more and more. 
the powerful elites, these swamp creatures, must be hiding something. They must have a secret plan to destroy the society. Stoiber is both a popular and populist politician. Last month, month, however, she was sentenced to two months in jail in an impeachment trial. This was because she, as Minister for Immigration in 2016, gave an illegal order to separate all married asylum-seeking partners where one was below the age of 18 without the possibility of individual case handling secured by the European Convention of Human Rights. Inside the courtroom, the courtroom impeachment trial, Stoiber's legal defense was based upon the claim that she did not give the illegal direct order to have the couple separated without individual assessments. Outside the court, literally standing just outside, she claimed that she would not hesitate to separate the couples without individual assessments again. This disregard for truth altogether, saying one thing at one moment, another the next, what Harry Frankfurt would refer to with the academic term bullshit, seems eerily recognizable as well. And the rallying against the arrogance of power while being so powerfully arrogant herself is something that Mr. Trump has excelled at as well. Um, I found this uh, a few days ago from the German tabloid uh, Bild, and it reads, Denmark hat jetzt eine Trumpine, meaning Denmark now has a Trumpess. Uh, and here we see her smiling with the cake, celebrating, making life harder for immigrants through 50 new laws that she signed as a minister. Um, so that was, uh, Denmark is not the only place that, that we are noticing um, that she might be this kind of figure in, in the political landscape. After the impeach impeachment verdicts, Stoiber was voted unworthy of a parliament seat and is now a columnist of paper, at least until most political commenters ex commentators expect she has a plan for a new political party. Uh, and she has somewhat of a cult following, perhaps overlapping with some of the protesters that you, we will see in a short while in another uh, example that I will give you. So Stoiber might be the most uh, prominent and the most popular Danish politician to paraphrase Trump directly, uh, but other politicians have endeavored the same. One quite interesting example is Rieske Petersen, who in 2018 launched his party, also named Klaus Rieske Petersen, in order to run for the coming national election. A businessman with several convictions of severe economic fraud and millions of corner in tax and bankruptcy debt, he was running on his image as a smart businessman who could find the solution to our political problems. In his first televised debate appearance prior to the election, he was pressed by another debater on his criminal past. Du skal ikke kalde mig en deplorable. Don't call me a deplorable. Rieske countered, not even using a Danish equivalent to the word deplorable in an all too clear reference to the American election a couple of years prior, where, where Hillary Clinton used the same, the word deplorable about a segment of voters. No one had in fact called him a deplorable or an equivalent Danish word in this situation. About Rieske's candidacy, political pundit Geo Metz wrote, in Klaus Rieske, Denmark has gotten its first Donald Trump in a discount version. Another but more disturbing example is Danish People's Party's member, Shannon Nielsen, who at the party's annual convention in September 2016, little more than a year after Trump's infamous speech at the, the announcement of his candidacy at the Trump Tower in New York and at the height of the 2016 US election campaigns, delivered a speech paraphrasing Trump Why would foreigners fend for themselves now that they have a right to housing and allowance from the state as soon as they get here? They litter, they deceive, they steal, they rape, and they kill. The resemblance to the racist rhetoric of Trump's campaign announcement speech with the sane and aphoric structure is uncanny and hardly coincidental, although Nielsen left out the concluding twist. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, the rapists, and I assume some are good people. Neither Rieske nor Nielsen have been very successful in their attempts at trumpeteering. Rieske was not elected and his use of deplorable, deplorable seemed too obvious and not well chosen, a 
a kind of showing his strategic hand that did not match his attempted image of moderate authenticity. And as for Nielsen and her party, they are now at their lowest polls for decades. However, that's partly because the Social Democrats have outcompeted them on immigration policy. Nonetheless, these examples show that the desire to harness and utilize the populist effects of Trump's appeal does exist among Danish politicians. But Trumpism does not only exist in the speeches of politicians. There are examples of the influence of, Trump, uh, of Trumpism on the citizen side as well. A prominent recent case of this is the fervent dislike some citizens harness towards Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen. As we speak, a commission has been put together to try to figure out what went wrong in the Mink scandal that I mentioned earlier. Outside the commission hearings, heated demonstrations are taking place with slogans of lock her up directed at Frederiksen. Here, no attempt seems to be made to deny the influence of Trumpism. It is used consciously to create hostility toward the female prime minister, who, in these people's view, should not be in power but put in jail for her crime of inhabiting the highest office in the land and of allegedly hiding her hidden agenda. Instead, opposition activists have been quick to tie the question of deleted text messages in the Mink scandal to the 2015 election outcry against Hillary Clinton's deleted emails. On the right here, we see a member of the youth chapter of Venstre, the main opposition party, and also the party who until recently uh, housed Inger Stoiberg, who makes this connection explicitly with a meta for prison banner. Uh, actually, he later deleted the tweet and again, the allusion to Trumpism is tempting for many, but also remains controversial in a Danish context. So misogyny, racism, and other forms of right-wing populism are, again, by no means phenomena originating in or exclusive to America. But the specific rhetorical forms these vices take in the political arena today, I'm sad to observe, sure seem to move quite easily across the Atlantic. However, and this is where this presentation turns uh, at least a bit more bright. Uh, I believe that our chances for understanding and countering this menacing rhetoric is offered by a rhetorical scholarship traveling in the same direction. On the matter of Trump's rhetoric specifically, two works that I found illuminating are Joshua Gunn's Political Perversion and Jennifer Mercieka's Demagogue for President. And these are two very different books tackling the phenomenon of Trump from radically different angles. Gunn's work lay out the broader cultural structures that make Trump's rhetoric so appealing and appalling. You might say appallingly appealing or appealingly appalling, while Mesheka zooms in on the specific rhetorical strategies used effectively by Trump. It is important to attend to both of these angles as we analyze and critique Danish expressions of Trumpeteering rhetoric. Is Denmark also starting to go through a mean-spirited turn in politics that is best understood as a structural perversion in our common culture? And to what extent does a speaker like Inger Stoiberg employ ad hominem, argument ad baculum, argument ad populum, reification and paralypsis to protect Danish values and drain the swamp? As my examples show, there is an intent to draw advantages of Trump's rhetoric in the Danish context but the attempts are often called out, poorly delivered, or rejected and regretted. But still, they persist. I think we need to ask what causes this uneasy tension in right-wing rhetoric in Denmark. We need to ask not only why political speakers attempt to translate the language and imagery of Trumpism in Denmark, but also what exactly happens in this translation, what is lost and distorted. In other words, what is our kind of structural perversion? To what totalitarian ends are dubious argument strategies put by rhetorical copycats, bullshitters, and deplorables. Of course, on a more fundamental level, which isn't about Trumpism specifically, US-based rhetorical theory has had and still has a profound influence of the work of Danish rhetoricians. And this influence is, luckily, a lot more positive. Uh, and to illustrate this, and, and this is where I kind of circle back to some of my own research, uh, I'll use an example from something I've been working on during my stay at UW. Uh, 
I'm contributing with a, a chapter for an anthology, anthology um, which is expected to come out next year, I believe, um, with the working title, Rhetorical Argumentation, the Copenhagen School. And in, in my essay, um, I read Austrian philosopher of science, Paul Feyerabend's classic Against Method, uh, which, is, which was published in 1975, not so much as a philosophy book, but as a polemical rhetorical text that constructs an enemy audience where, where Feyerabend ridicules rationalist philosophers of science. And I then looked to the reviews of the book to try to understand how this enemy audience actually received the provocations and ridicule. While against method does not necessarily provide a compelling argument according to traditional criteria of formal logic and other classic schools of argumentation studies, it can be considered a forceful and even valuable rhetorical artifact that works at lasting influence exactly as something else than a classical argument, in much the same way that Feyerabend himself hoped to show that scientific progress is most likely to happen. I then argue that this shows that polemics and provocations might be valuable and even desirable, not only to political debate in the public sphere, but also within more specialized communities and technical spheres. And so where's the American in influence in this? And it's all over. <laughs> I get my uh, conception of polemics from Erin Rand's article on the queer polemics of AIDS activist Larry Kramer, where she argues that the polemical form has a special potential to produce unpredictable effects. Polemics is, in this sense, a productively queer rhetoric. I get my normative framework for viewing the rowdy, rowdy rhetoric of the trickster, even as it occurs in a more specialized field of argumentation, as something democratically, or in the case of firearm, epistemically productive, um, a productive thing from uh, Robert Ivey's work on post 9-11 rhetoric. And of course, the whole myth methodology driving the essay a text, textual intertextual close reading of Against Method and its reviews is drawn from Professor Leah Ciccarelli's Rhetoric of Science classic, Shaving Science with Rhetoric. Um, and whenever this uh, Copenhagen School anthology materializes, you can be sure to see the influence of US-based scholarship all throughout it. Uh, maybe so much so that one can just for a second start to doubt whether the Copenhagen School is a reference to Copenhagen, New York, or perhaps Denmark, Wisconsin. Those are real places, by the way, that I, <laughs> that I looked up and found. Um, so my main point is on the one hand, there are some regrettable inference from American political rhetoric in practice on the political climate in Denmark. And on the other, for rhetoricians, there's an invaluable influx of rhetorical criticism and theory that can help us make sense of this development and ultimately help counter it and which enriches the work of Danish rhetoricians immensely. So finally, to turn back to an example from the Danish political debate, uh, these Trumpism tendencies are of course being countered on the parliamentary left. Here, uh, what we see is a political bus ad from SF, the Socialist People Party, who is actually uh, directly pleading for Americans living in Denmark to vote in the 2015 US elections. The ad is quite cleverly thought out with the crazy eyes of Trump rolling around in the, in the wheels of the bus uh, as the bus drives forward. This can perhaps be seen as a progressive, progressive way of harnessing the political effects surrounding Trump to brand the party on the side of sanity, global stability and progress. But we must, we must also ask whether this rhetorical strategy in the end might contribute to the problems by placing a big picture of Trump in the public space drawing attention to the perversion and high-speed demagoguery that we love to claim is not a part of the Danish political culture. By rejecting Trump largely and visually, visually and loudly, are we then risking drawing him into our matters even more? Um, I hope that you all have some comments, maybe some good advice on all these issues. Um, and all I can say is that I've had a very informative stay here at the department and uh, I take a lot uh, home with me. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Frederick, for that wonderful presentation. It gave us a lot, lot of insights on 
across national influences. Yes, I see a lot of people uh, clapping hands. Yes, it's an excellent presentation. All right, so um, again, as a reminder, if you have a, have a question, uh, please raise your hand and I would call the people in order. Um, yes, Russell Hansen can go first. Hi, um, I love the presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, have you noticed any kind of like particularly Danish twists on the populist rhetoric um, that you know has been imported by Trump? Do you see anything that's like incompatible between you know the U.S. version and the Danish version? Um, it's like stuff that doesn't carry over. And then, is there anything that gets added? It's like you know a sort of populism that would work in Denmark that doesn't work in the United States. Yeah, thank you for that question. That that is um, what I was trying to 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 get at. Also in the presentation was that these are some very important questions to ask. Like uh, I I was asking, what is the first of all, what is the perceived need to translate these tendencies, but also what gets kind of lost in the translation, what gets distorted, and why is it that a lot of this uh, tends to not work for some of these speakers? Um, and I think part of that is um, that Danish politics, as it is now, uh, is not as intensely uh, focused on uh, few persons. <laughs> so there is a multi-party system. There are more characters in the picture, whereas in the, in the US presidential campaign, you will have the two candidates. And you will intensely focus on, on their personality. Um, and, and, and this, of course, is put into you know, a wider um, very, very fast paced media and social media landscape, uh, which I think, um, I think I don't, I just simply don't think we're quite there yet in the Danish context. And so um, this very, very, um, what, what Gunn would say was like this perverse tendency to, to put someone down uh, or to like the quick enjoyment of, of, of the, of the, of saying the forbidden is not as attractive <laughs> yet in, in this context. Um, so maybe that that's kind of uh, answering a bit of a question. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't uh, I haven't really come that far with these um, with these idea yet. May, uh, and maybe some of my uh, Danish colleagues who are here today have something uh, to con contribute to that if they if they'd like. So yeah, it's a great question and an important question to to look at in in the future. I think. Leah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a somewhat similar question, but having to do with sort of concepts and theories of rhetoric. Um, and maybe it's not fair to ask you this. Maybe we need to send a student from the US to Copenhagen and ask them the question. But um, what do you think the Copenhagen School has to add uh, for those of us who want to understand what's going on with Trump in the United States? Um, what, what um, you know, theoretical advancements uh, could help us uh, to um, untangle uh, this, uh, not, not necessarily the influence, the a bad influence, from, but the, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the influence of our own um, uh, political perversions. And rhetorical citizenship is like one, uh, one concept that immediately comes to mind, but I'm, I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I, I, that's a great question also. And I think you're definitely right to, to pinpoint rhetorical citizenship uh, as, as a special way that we tend to view um, view this these problems in, in the light of at the University of Copenhagen, where we say that, um, well, re rhetoric is something that everyone has to do in a way. Uh, as a receiver of rhetoric, you, you have to um, you have to weigh these arguments against each other and think about it. And you have to participate uh, in certain ways uh, in the rhetorical ecology. Uh, to to do your citizen duties, um, and I'm not sure. Um, I haven't ever thought about how uh, this is translating over to an American context, and and I'm not maybe not the right person to to talk about that. Um, but I think um, some of the work that uh, Christian Koch has done is uh, is quite interesting, and he's been doing it. I've, I've Recently, uh, I read Dana Cloud's book, uh, Reality Bites, where she talks about fact-checking. 
and and I think some of the work she's getting at saying that it's not enough just to fact check check something like Trump. You have to frame check it as well, right? You have to. Um, you will never win this debate if you just point out that he's lying because that's not really the whole picture and that's not what it's all about. And I think that some of that work has been on on Christian's plate actually for a lot of years, um, saying that it's good to to fact to point out these things, but it's also good to you know rhetoric check <laughs> and saying um, why are this he might be wrong, but why is he? Uh, why is this rhetoric also uh, harmful, in, maybe in a rhetorical citizenship framework? Uh, and maybe that's also some of the things that Jennifer Mischieka is getting at in her book, saying, well, uh, he, she's quite prerogative in saying, like, he's a rhetorical genius, Donald, Donald Trump. <laughs> and she's saying that because uh, she, she thinks that what he did worked. And then she said, instead of, instead of you know, instead of just uh, proving him wrong, we have to really understand this what is wrong with this retor rhetorical form. And I think that's a very important part of um, what we tend to do in, in, uh, at the University of Copenhagen and in a Danish context. Carolyn. Yeah. To Lüge, Frederick, they were a really fine presentation. Um, I have a question about uh, immigration. It seems to be one of the top issues that's traveling from the US where we have mostly a two party system uh, into a multi party context in Denmark. Um, with, of course, Meta Frederiksen uh, embracing some of the anti immigration folks in her own um, group. I'm curious about how immigration as an issue. Um, uh, the rhetorical strategies you mentioned are very much uh, examples from the far right wing. Are there some examples that are more um, prevalent also among the social democrats? Uh, I mean, they they have <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> and 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 then the simple answer to that is that the the middle of politics has just moved to the right uh, in Denmark, so that you will see uh, the same. You will not see something like the example with the, you know, they come here and they murder and they, like the social democrats will not say that. And even, even for the Danish People's Party politicians to say it was quite controversial. And uh, she was also, uh, uh, I don't know if she was convicted uh, for racism, but she was uh, at least, um, what do you call it? She was charged uh, to the police <laughs> for saying it actually. So, um, so we have, so if the question is whether that the social democrats have adopted uh, right-wing tactics uh, in rhetoric and in political practice, then for sure, yeah. But um, I'm not sure that they are so Trumpist all the time. Um, and actually what I saw most recently was the, um, the immigration um, speaker for social democrats, he had in a, a, a paper article where he compared the leader of the opposition party to Trump. So they're using Trump in that way to say, still to say like, this is something that we don't like uh, and very explicitly trying to distancing themselves from it. Um, so that's also in play. And I think what's characterized the, the expression of Trumpism in Denmark is always this play towards um, kind of want to use what Trump is doing, but we can't really, and we also want to push him away at the same time. And it's, it, that's like the un, unstable, uneasy tension that I, that I think is there. Um, and, 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 and again, if, if some of my uh, Danish colleagues has comments on this that they would like to weigh into, <laughs> please do. Tuck the day. And I'm going to call about myself. Uh, I have so many questions, uh, and I think this is really interesting, but I'm going to ask three interrelated questions that I would love to hear your opinion, because this is a a problem that my, myself is also grappling. Uh, I study the conspiracism and uh, how people perceive uh, conspiratorial candidates. Now, so my first question is, how would you, what would you say would be the defining characteristics of the Trump style rhetoric? Because Trump uses rhetoric on a lot of different issues, on immigration, there's, sometimes it's conspiracism, sometimes it's a populist type of rhetoric. What would you say is the Trump style rhetoric? And the second related question 
is, which is kind of related, would be what is the impact of importing a Trump style rhetoric as opposed to importing rhetoric from other populist politicians? That's thinking about Erdogan or Hugo Chavez. They also use populist type of rhetoric. Do you think there's a difference in impact whether uh, the Danish community imported a Trump style rhetoric as opposed to um, populist rhetoric from other places? And finally, the question is, what is left out of the Trump style rhetoric? So when you, so, for, so again, Trump talks about a lot of different things. And did you observe things that were heavily emphasized in the United States context of the Trump style rhetoric, but you did not observe that in the Danish context? Uh, I would love to hear your comments on these things. Yeah, so um, I think I will start with your last uh, question first uh, and say that I think uh, and again, this is because might be because of Trump's being such not a very popular figure actually in Denmark. So there's a lot that is not that is there's a lot that is left out. Um, and I think specifically his uh, climate rhetoric and his uh, his stance on that is not really something we see uh, at least anymore in Denmark. That was actually something we saw more maybe 15 or 20 years ago. The, the denialism. Uh, on that on that sub area and that and there is just um, you might say luckily in Danish politics that doesn't translate very well because there's a consensus that that's global warming is real in the, in almost all parties I think in some to some degree in all political parties in parliament so I just haven't seen uh, it it has mostly been immigration uh, topos and you know um all all this uh, and like uh, the elites are corrupt kind of uh, populist uh, topos they they have they have translated and and speci specifically uh, the last one has translated a lot in the last couple of years during the covid crisis because um because of the pretty hard lockdown that the government uh, made and that is just uh, that makes it easier to use the idea that uh, you know the elites think they know what's good for us and they are trying to tell us what to do and that is just in the ballpark of uh, of trump <laughs> right so so what i think about the most is that climate is 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 kind of left out which i guess we should be happy <laughs> because because uh, climate climate uh, is is kind of central to the trump to what the Trump presiden presidency was about, right? And one of the first things he did was uh, to to take down the the climate signs from uh, from the, from the White House website and all that. So uh, that was like a really important uh, th thing in his presidency, and we haven't seen that translated very much. Um, and yeah, what is the <laughs> what is the Trump style rhetoric? How do I define that? That was the first question, right? And uh, I tried in this presentation to just start with where do I see some actual um, conscious use of Trump's rhetoric in the Danish context so not not looking so much at uh, at the definition of the concept but see where where do speakers actually consciously use allusions to Trump um, so uh, that that is what I thought was was most interesting to look at um, and I think uh, I think Gunn has a really Joshua Gunn has a really interesting uh, definition of of it as you know political perversion and and I think what he means by that is is something like um, we have to understand Trump rhetoric as something uh, enjoyable uh, people enjoy doing it and Trump enjoy doing it and it's 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 like the the quick fix of uh, being politically incorrect is just enjoyable to people and 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 of course he comes from it as uh, from a psychoanalysis point of view and he uses uh, he's very inspired by Shakla Khan and, and stuff like that where uh, politics often will boil down to what do people enjoy doing uh, but I think there's something there's something true in that um, and and I I think there's something about in about very dark enjoyment that that defines Trump style rhetoric uh, in many ways um 
yeah, I don't know if that that question answers your question. Yeah, yes, it does. And I just wanted to follow up on the the other question on what do you think about Trump Trump's rhetoric, uh, the impact of Trump's rhetoric as opposed oh, yeah. to other populist uh, candidates. I know I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, um, I think at least it's interesting why. Uh, I mean, you could say that it's just the reason that it has such a big impact in Denmark is just is just because the U.S. has just a big impact on Denmark in all cultural domains, uh, and that's and you know that's maybe just like a simple explanation of why that is happening. Um, yeah, Christine. Thanks. Great talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe I'm just kind of following up on Jens' com, uh, question of the examples that you gave, or at least um, a number of them were, you know, sort of straight up quotes of Trump's drain the swamp and um, lock her up, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm curious about how much cachet does Trump himself have in Denmark versus just um, him sort of being proof of concept that a certain version of demagoguery, um, populist, sort of appealing to people's fears, but also their kind of perverted, the perverted pleasures that Josh Gunn points to, um, that, that he's kind of a proof of concept that that style, that rhetorical style that has a long standing tradition in Europe um, still has legs or has new life. Um, potentially as part of this larger global or at least Western movement toward a particular style of, of a particular kind of political style um, and rhetoric. So I guess I'm just wondering how much of it is is Trump and how much is it the rhetorical uh, structure of demagoguery um, that you think is at work here? Yeah, and that's a great question. And in some in some senses, um... I was talking about this uh, issue with uh, with my partner, and she said, "Well, Trump is also uh, inspired by European <laughs> right wingers, uh, so we can't you can't actually see it as uh, exactly yeah. so much like a one way street, right? right? And and she's of course right about that. And you see um, figures in in European politics like um, Silvio Berlusconi in Italy, who was also you know, uh, real estate uh, magnet uh, who comes into politics from the outside, right? And and uh, kind of being a populist in the same sense. And and you see other other people in in all around Europe uh, coming from actually the world of entertainment into politics in the same way that Trump did or reality TV. So so it it, it is it's of course uh, pretty messy <laughs> to to try to see what is what is like general appeal of demagoguery and what is the general appeal of Trump uh, in in Europe and I, I don't think I have a I have a very clear answer to that <laughs> and maybe uh, maybe it's it's hard to give one um, because it, it might be both things right it might be uh, that he's appealing because well we have this tradition already and we it, it never really left uh, sort of the borderline fascist uh, <laughs> appeals just never left our, our culture. And that's what makes it so readily, readily applicable. Um, but at the same time, it is not totally applicable. Um, and that's the, that's the weird tension there. Yeah, but it's the same in the States, right? That it's just like he he's given he's given this kind of confidence and this proof of of, um, you know, that there's a, a lot of people people for whom his style and his message is very, um, very appealing. And so it just I think we're seeing that across Europe and the States. But yeah, yeah. there's, there's an interesting need to to brand things. This is the, the Danish Trump, or this is the right. French Trump. Right now in France, we have uh, Eric Seymour, who is like who is being labeled the new French Trump, and he's he's running for the election, and he's uh, and of course there's some similarities, but he's also not like Trump. He's kind of he's like a right wing intellectual, uh, <laughs> where Trump is like more an anti intellectual. Uh, so, but there's still there's this need to say. Here we have the Trump here, and here we have the new Trump here, uh, and yeah, it's just really 
it's just really interesting in many ways yeah I don't see any hands up. Are there others who would like to join our lovely discussion on Trump everywhere? I'm that's what he's so good at, right? He, he, <laughs> yeah. he can be everywhere. He, he can that's be a everywhere. very special yeah. skill he has. Uh, Kirsten. I just wanted to note again, I really enjoyed the talk and one aspect I was really struck by that it seems like you could pursue further if you want it was the visual rhetoric um that you were seeing mapped across and it you know there's of course the the words themselves but there's 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 something to be said also about the parody aspect of some of those visuals as well as the unfortunately very um you know sincere aspect on the part of the rhetoric the rhetors using um you know adopting trumpist terms so i just that is curious to me it just made me think wow i wonder you know there, there's a study to be done there of the kinds of visuals that you know you displayed um for another time but yeah something to, to pay attention to i guess yeah it's, that's super interesting um i hope i have to more with that in point yeah Right, Patricia, did you have some closing remarks on the upcoming colloquiums and um, other things? Well, we do have a wonderful lineup of colloquia from between February and May, and uh, Fredericks is the first for 2022. Um, it's a great start, and we are eager to have people show up for the other ones, um, the, most of them are the standard 3.30 time. So thank you for carving out some time for us today.